Welcome to everyone and thank you immensely for joining us with delivering our Medicine for Members event, Starlight Neonatal Unit. I'd like to apologise for the horrendous weather out there. It's, <laughs> it's, it's quite surprising. Um, how it's just come about suddenly, but hopefully we may finish a bit early. Also, can I just quickly mention, um, if you've not registered your parking, please can you let Matt know so that you can have some assistance with regards to your parking. We have ordered refreshments, but it's a bit delayed. I suspect it's because of the weather. So hopefully, hopefully we will have some refreshments at the end. Let's blame it all on the weather. Yeah. <laughs> I am Marva Sami, and I'm a senior sister here at Barnet. I manage an acute surgical ward. I'm also an elective governor for the Barnet site as from September 2017. I started my nursing career here at Barnet over 30 years ago and I have remained at this hospital throughout my career. I am passionate and remain committed to working as part of the Royal Free and the NHS to deliver quality care to patients and to support families and friends. I am also dedicated to the principles of being a governor. We want to make a difference in our community and I strongly believe that through our work we can achieve this goal. My interest in becoming a governor across arose sorry, because I want to continue to be an effective member of this trust and use my experience of having been in this trust for so long to contribute and to promote a culture which is focused on patients and staff. I live locally and I have done so for the past 30 years. A factor I also consider to be relevant. I am part of this community and so like yourselves, I believe I want to continue to support Barnet Hospital in facilitating the best care to patients here and also across our organisation. I am passionate about representing patient and staff with regards to our community interests and I understand the pivotal role healthcare plays in our community. We want to see the bigger picture and drive up improvement at clinical service level. This presentation this evening will demonstrate all the hard work and commitment all our staff at all levels have achieved to deliver service improvement. Medicine for Members events a part of a programme of engagement with trust members. Medicine for Members events are chaired by governors and organised by the membership office with support from the communications team. The topic for each Medicine for Members event is now suggested by local members. To make the topic relevant to the community and patient cohort at the relevant hospital site. Now that the topic is decided by the local member council, the Medicine for Member events will be held at all three hospital sites to help to improve engagements and attendance. This is our first event at Barnet Hospital. We have had one event already at the Royal Free site. Medicine for Members events are hosted and chaired by a council member of Governors. Governors are elected to represent the interests of patients, staff and the public. Members are consulted in planning the event in order to establish the areas of our work that the membership would like to hear about. Can I now introduce you to a little housekeeping? Just to point out that our fire exit is through here, through this door and up the stairs. 
It's quite well lit. <laughs> it is quite well lit. <laughs> the assembly point is towards the Barnet Nursery, which is signposted. If the alarm is activated, we will hear continuous sound and alarm, and we must vacate and proceed. The toilets are located on my left, <coughs> through the doors. Finally, may I also kindly ask our attendees to wait for our question and answer session at the end, which is on the agenda. Those of us asking questions must raise our hands and wait for the microphone to be passed. Also state in your name and then speak in. We also have governors present. Governors. And we will be available after the formalities to meet and greet and have a chat with you. So now let's all begin and I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Shaw the Chief Exec of Barnet Hospital. Marva, um, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you. That's a, a great start to this evening. Um, my name is Steve Shaw. I'm Chief Executive. I'm a consultant in intensive care, and actually, I was at Barnet Hospital in 1997, so not 30 years ago, but 20 years ago, uh, or 21, as a locum consultant working with uh, Tony, actually. And after a, sh a little sojourn at the Royal Free for 20 years, uh, I've, I've, I've come back here to this, this hospital. Now, uh, this is, as Marva says, this is the first one of these events we've done for Barnet. Over the years, we've done loads and loads, actually, at the Royal Free. And I think this is a great thing, time to really celebrate, actually, some of the great work that is going on in the hospital. It's very easy in the current time, in the current climate, especially this time of year, the NHS and this hospital is under immense pressure, staff working absolutely flat out uh, to deliver fantastic care. But it's very easy to get wrapped up in the things that, that sometimes aren't going so well or their issues. And actually the things that are going well far outnumber those issues. So the real thing for, for, for me tonight is, is, is to really Look, look, go through this, and, and really, there is some really, really great stuff here. And I'm not that I, I wasn't, I wasn't clear of all the stuff that's going on. Share it with, share it with you all, and I hope it's going to be a, a really exciting, interesting evening. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say any more than that. It's, it's your, it's your, your show, Marva, your thing, and, and um, with, with no further ado, I think it's. Um, Tim is, Tim, yeah, Tim. so I'll just hand over to Tim Wickham, who's the Divisional, Divisional Director of Women's and Children's Services. Well, it's definitely going to be interesting and exciting, Steve. I'm, I can guarantee <laughs> that. Um, my name's uh, Tim Wickham. I'm uh, one of the ne neonatal consultants on the unit. I'm also Divisional Director. It's just the possibility we're all going to get us get to know each other a little better than we'd planned if it carries on snowing. So if, um, I have actually been snowed in here before, so it can be quite tricky getting out. That road going up on the way out is slightly dodgy, so it is still snowing. OK, let's kick off. Um, no, we've done that one. <laughs> OK, so um, it, it's, it's lovely to get the opportunity to talk about what we do and kind of fly our flag and, uh, and thank you for the governors for asking us. Um, the neonatal unit uh, at Barnet is something that is obviously very close to my heart. Now, neonates has changed a lot uh, uh, over the years. This, this initial picture, which is a bit distorted, but I think you can see, um, probably when I was a neonate, mm, maybe neonatal units looked a bit like this but there was a there was a separation so premature babies were removed from their mother and they were put in these kind of boxes this is a this is uh, this probably i don't know if you can see as a baby in there um and parents didn't have much to do with it really they were outside looking in and there might be glass where you kind of peer in and that's my baby the third on the right but there was very little uh, interaction and there's the team all working away looking over the, after these babies. 
we've moved a long way since then. And here at Barnet, we absolutely pride ourselves in moving further than pretty much, pretty much any unit in the UK, actually. We're, we're modeling our care on some of the stuff that's going on in Europe. Um, so the middle slide here is presently what we're doing, um, which is very different to this. Here's the mum, the baby's inside, inside that incubator. She's in her own room, she's in her own space with her baby. And a lot of this is going on. Um, if you think about a premature baby, and I, I have an example of, this is not a premature baby, this is an example of one. Um, this is probably a, we think probably about a 26 week uh, baby. Babies normally stay inside their mums until about 40 weeks. So 26 weeks is a little bit over halfway. Um, so very small, very delicate. The best place for this baby is suspended in a, in a beautiful, warm, perfectly controlled environment. Never varies from uh, body temperature. Very little noise, very little light <coughs> inside the womb. That's where it's supposed to be. Um, we can't reproduce the womb. So the baby's come out, we're presented with the baby. This is so obviously not the womb over here. Neither is this and neither is this. But this is a lot closer uh, to what the baby should be getting, which is uh, close contact with their mother, warmth, uh, and we try and control, control the environment, sound um, and light. And, and you'll see in the presentation uh, as it's not just me talking, you'll be glad to hear. As we go through, we'll be really focusing on individualised care and our, our approach, uh, which is, I'm very pleased to be able to say, unique in London and probably in the UK here at Barnet that we're actually delivering it. Um, going the wrong way. Um, so just a little bit more, but one of the other things that family-centred care, well, it's all linked into individualised care, it's linked into keeping the mums very involved. So just a little bit about the unit. It's 30 cots. Um, it's a level two unit, uh, which uh, at that N, the LNU stands for local neonatal unit. So there are three types of neonatal unit in the country. <coughs> there are level one units, level two units, and level three units. This is a level two unit. We have a level one unit at, um, at the Royal Free. And level three units are the big centres in places like UCH and the Hammersmith. So the difference is uh, sometimes the size, though 30 cots is quite a big. We're probably, we're certainly one of the biggest level two units in the country, if not probably in the top. I'm looking at Claire, two or three, third, third biggest in the UK. Um, so a small level three unit might look a little bit like our unit. The only difference is that we don't do some of the very high intensive care stuff and we don't do surgery, um, but we do most of the other stuff. We get a, just under 6,000 deliveries, which equates to about 600 admissions to our unit. So we have about 600, somewhere in the region of 600 babies every year. Um, as it says, the third busiest. Uh, so it equates to about 3,000 intensive care or high dependency days. So somewhere in the region of eight to ten uh, babies in intensive care or high dependency every day. And there are lots of other babies in lower level in special care and getting ready for home, etc. Uh, we've got a really dedicated staff, obviously. Um, I mean, it kind of when I say obviously, uh, I, uh, we have a great team. We have lots of our senior nurses have been here for years. Uh, this is their baby as much as it is ours. Um, and the neonatal consultants. Some of us have been here for around, I, I started in 2003. Um, and I think, yes, I am now, sadly, the, the oldest member of the team. So <laughs> it, it kind of comes up on you and suddenly you realise you're the senior guy, having started as the most junior guy. Um, and we have really good staff retention. We have, <coughs> I think we have a, a very good team that's mostly very happy uh, with the work they're doing. Um, so our patients are primarily premature babies, uh, anywhere between, so, so as I said, term is 40 weeks, um, so anything below 37 weeks is considered premature. Uh, we look after babies from 26 weeks and up. If you're less than 26 weeks, 
if your uh, borderline of survival is 23 weeks. So if you're 23 to 26 weeks, you need to be in a tertiary centre. We, we can stabilise you if you're born here, but we would always aim to try and get you to the tertiary centre where they're more kitted up for looking after such tiny babies. So a 23-weeker a would be even smaller than this. Um, and we look after term babies that are unexpectedly unwell, babies that have congenital abnormalities, and the re repatriation is, so the 23-weeker that's born at UCH, when they're a bit bigger, a bit older, a bit more robust, they come up to us, and they, so they might spend the majority of their uh, special care with us, even though they started off in the level three unit. <coughs> um, so we don't do surgical babies, we don't do tiny, tiny babies, um, and if, if, if you're going to have complex problems, we would always try and get you delivered at the tertiary centre. Um, just a little bit about, just to fly our flag a little bit more, the CQC um, didn't inspect uh, our service this, this year, just gone, well, last year, um, but the previous inspection gave us an outstanding as one of the, I think, three departments, or maybe the four departments, but um, we got an outstanding from the CQC. Um, and we, we, we focus on our, our parent accessibility. Um, when I started um, in 2003, parents were excluded from the intensive care room during the ward round. So, you know, the doctors would come in and we would go around and the parents would all go out and then they would come back later. Um, and that never felt quite right and we, we, we've changed that. Um, not all units have, but parents are encouraged to be there for the ward round and we have a, a slightly curious um, system with headphones. So parents can stay with their babies uh, and they can do their skin to skin um, and they all have their headphones on, but when we get to their baby, they take their headphones off so we can talk to them. Um, and that's, obviously it's a, it's a confidentiality thing. It's a relatively small space. There could be six or seven babies in the one room. Uh, and we're talking all about the baby you can hear. So the idea is to get a bit of, still keep together, but have a little bit of uh, privacy. Um, okay. Ah. So I, I'm nearly done. So we're nearly. Uh, um, I just wanted to show you a few things. I mean, you've seen the baby. Um, most of you are probably familiar. Um, I'm, I'm sure Terry's, fa Terry's familiar with one of these. He's just had a baby. Probably maybe not that big. I don't know. But the, the, so this, this so here's a normal baby. So this, this is here's here's what, here's uh, the kind of thing that our babies have. So it, it, it it's small. There's a, a, a that's a medium sized nappy. There's a nappy, <laughs> pretty small. Um, and for the medics in the room, kind of a, an, an average kind of adult cannula. Obviously, everyth everything's the same, really. I mean, that looks just like that, just a lot smaller. Um, so uh, it, it, it's a t it obviously, it's a size can be a challenge, but you know, that's what we're there for. Um, we've, we've all got the, we've learned the skills and everything, so. Um, it's not a problem. Thank you, my love. So I'm the OT on Starlight, and nobody ever knows what an occupational therapist does. But um, our job is to, we're trained in physical development and mental health. So our job on the neonatal unit is to support the development of the babies and the mental health of the families. Um, so um, we know neonatal care is super important and the environment is super important. And that's because for babies, their brains are growing at a rapid rate. Nowhere else in the hospital is such dramatic um, neurology happening. So your brain is going to increase in weight by 400% while you're on the neonatal unit. So you need to have someone really focusing on development to get it right. For families, it is where you become a family for the first time. And for some families, we're tying them into a relationship with the NHS for a lifetime. So again, we need to get it right. And for staff, this is why it's super important, and when Mr Hunt forgets this, he gets it all wrong. But for staff, if you don't look at the environment, it didn't, doesn't work. You have to retain your staff, so you really need to focus on families, infant and staff. And in neonatal care, we are pretty brilliant at keeping babies alive, and we can keep them alive younger and younger. So 
you're viable now at 22 weeks gestation. So every, every so often you get a 22 weeker somewhere in the United Kingdom. And the prevalence of cerebral palsy is pretty static. So that's not on the rise at all. But things like developmental coordination disorder, sensory processing difficulties, autism, that's all massively on the rise. So it's, it's no longer okay just to focus on the medical side. You also have to look at the developmental side. And the developmental side is the responsibility of all of us. So this is a nice slide to explain what is happening on the neonatal unit. And we're always, um, I know wherever you work in the hospital, you think that your unit or your ward is the most important, but no, um, nobody is gonna have the same impact on brain development. So at 25 weeks, your brain is a smooth gelatinous substance and it has to do all its cortical folding, myelination, proliferation, and it has to increase in weight by 400%. So it does the same from getting to term and to adult. So everything we do on the neonatal unit is going to matter, impacts on how these babies develop. So we have learnt a lot. Um, and in the past, we used to think that babies were blank slates that couldn't tell us anything, that they were super resilient, that because their pain pathways weren't well myelinated, that they couldn't feel pain. And we now know these all to be myths. If it hurts an adult, it hurts a baby. Um, they are um, growing brains so rapidly and the emotional tagging in the memory that happens is huge. So you are designed to develop in 360 degrees of fluid. It is dark in there. It's not quiet because you've got the slush of the amniotic fluid and you can hear your mother's digestion and your mother's heartbeat. But you come into this nice tucked position so your hands come to the middle. So if you look at you all right now, you're all folded nicely in the middle. It's how the human race works. None of you are sitting out here like this. But it starts, it starts in utero. And if you're born early, we've taken that ideal environment away from you. And it's going to impact if we don't do something about it. So this is probably a typical picture of any baby in any neonatal unit up and down the country. But from a sensory point of view, these are not the sensory experiences that you're meant to have. So your tactile system is your largest sensory system. And you can feel everything from 24 weeks and you are most sensitive around your hands and your mouth and your feet. And in order to survive, that's where we're gonna come at you. So we have cannulas in, we have CPAP. When you're born early, this side of your body develops first and then gravity pulls you down. And this baby's been popped on their tummy for respiratory issues, but it's the hardest position to get out of. So it's why we need to work so closely with families and with our team to make sure that they recognize the language of the babies and what they're telling us and what sensory experiences are appropriate. Would this baby be happier in side lying so that he can bring his hands together or his hands up to his mouth? Whenever I show this picture, everybody says, what family do you know who looks like this? And <laughs> <laughs> there, there is none, but this is your Instagram family. And the point is, when you're pregnant, you have an idea of what life's going to be like and you're, you're going to go home and you're going to have your organic cotton sheets and you're going to be able to have the windows and the music playing and it's going to be how your family's formed for the first time. And then if life throws a curveball at you and this is where you end up, it is in direct contrast with what you have. Suddenly, you've got possibly 120 very well-meaning people all trying to parent your baby. And, um, and also you've got the harsh lights, the bright environments, and you've, you've got, you know, if you've got other children, you're torn between running between A and B. The implications of being on the neonatal unit are huge. And for many of our families, you'll be in crisis mode and in trauma, and they'll just turn up and they'll function and they'll do a really good job. And then they'll go home and it suddenly all falls apart because getting over this isn't, isn't a quick th fix thing. And I think it's very naive of us to think it is. So if I go through just a couple of initiatives that we do on um, Starlight to try and, try and improve our practice. So this is just a, a model um, from Philips Healthcare. And what they show is your sensory systems are at the heart of it. 
And then we have different developmental initiatives under each petal. So we have things like partnering with families, positioning and handling, safeguarding sleep. If you can't sleep, then you can't grow a brain. Optimising nutrition, reducing stress and pain. And that's really important because if we <coughs> flood new, like nervous systems with too much cortisol, it impacts on their memory and learning later on. And we have one for skin to skin and um, pain, I've said pain and stress management. And the way we've done it is that we put one of our neonatologists in charge of each area because then everybody listens a little bit. So they had to write a vision statement so for the pain and stress one, the vision statement is, it is our intent to ensure that all patients on Starlight are free from pain and stress in order to facilitate their physical growth and emotional development. And then we're doing a whole lot of little quality improvement projects to see if we can ins um, improve it. Um, and so... <laughs> Parenting occupations are super, I love an occupation, being an occupational therapist, but parenting occupations are super important. Everything from the first tube feed needs to be relationship based, um, from the first nappy to taking your baby out for kangaroo care. And so what we try to do is go through each area with the parents. We talk about um, the importance of holding your baby and smelling your baby. We're asking you to attach and attune to your baby and breastfeed them, but sometimes miles apart. And that's really hard. So you've got to tap into all your sensory systems to enable that to happen. And the way it's arranged is kind of developmentally how your sensory systems come online. Um, so... Families will get a um, developmental advice package um, where they go through different areas. We use this a lot and then um, there are some really good apps on the market now. So we're saving the planet, not having to print out loads of paper. So we often give the parents the apps as well. This is our Starlight. We have a Starlight parent newsletter. This one needs updating. And we have a Starlight team newsletter as well. But this just goes to explains a little bit about developmental care and just some of the initiatives that we run on the unit. So we have, this is the families one. We have coffee, cake and coping, which has just been changed for the afternoon. And the af it's now um, run by our CAMS liaison nurse and by our nursery nurses. And so it's there for peer support, an opportunity to families just to offload and talk. But um, also the nursery nurses will do a little bit of what was used to be called parent craft, so like massage or resus training or breastfeeding workshop. So they're very flexible about whoever's there and it's run brilliantly now. And it used to be just like an hour and it was a bit sort of run to the next thing. And now it's, it's a really nice two hour relaxed pace. We also follow all our high risk infants for two years and um, I think uh, we're probably one of the few areas that does it to this extent. A lot of areas up and down the UK will see babies at two years and do a developmental assessment. We'll see the babies at term where we do an NBAS assessment and Prectal which is looking at their general movements. And then we will also, we'll see them at three months, six months, one year and two year. <coughs> From an OT's point of view, it's to make sure that we can give the next stage of development. And if we have any concerns at all, then we can provide <coughs> the appropriate referrals and make sure the support's in there. When I speak to some of my um, neonatal um, colleagues, they say it's so that we can also have the stats to show if our care is working or not. So it's probably a two way thing. But it's really, I think, super important to do. And then we hand over to Claire. Hello. Um, my name's Claire Kane. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm a consultant neonatologist and I'm the neonatal clinical service lead for the whole of the Royal Free Trust. Um, I too have been working for the Trust uh, for the last over 20 years now, on and off, and I've been a consultant here for 10 years. So, thinking about our individualised care rooms, we're extremely lucky here at Barnet to have this quite unique and amazing facility. Um, we have rooms where mums and babies, or dads and babies, or other carers and babies can stay together 24 hours a day, and this is 
a model of care that's very popular in many parts of Europe and in the States, but we are the first neonatal unit in the country to be able to provide this service. And it makes sense that by putting individual, um, having an individual environment for mum and baby, we're able to individualise the lighting, the sound, any stimulation for that baby. We can also help with infection control because the babies are separated from other babies in an open bay. And of course, our rooms provide an amazing amount of privacy for our families. And this has multiple benefits. Of course, they can provide a lot more kangaroo care, skin to skin, and uh, it helps support breastfeeding. But also, it helps for the parents to spend lots of time one-to-one -one with their babies, recognising their cues, speaking to Emily and our occupational therapists, and working to get to know their babies really very, very well a long time before they go home. And it also helps them with their interaction with the medical and nursing staff, having a private environment to discuss their baby's medical needs. And it gives them a sense of control. The families are expected to speak to us during ward rounds, explain to us what they think is going on with their baby, and their thoughts and impressions on how their baby is are extremely important. And they are very much part of the multidisciplinary team, a, a fundamental part. And, a, and it absolutely helps to facilita facilitate discharge. Elsewhere in the country, you'll find mothers and fathers rooming in for two to three days before discharge. That would be the usual practice. Here at Barnet, we can have parents rooming in often for several, for many weeks, and that enables them to learn how to provide medications for their babies. Many of our babies still need quite a lot of medical input when they go home. They might need special um, medication, they might have some special equipment, and by being with their baby 24 hours a day for several weeks, they, the parents can learn how to do that. It's quite an organic process, rather than having someone coming in and teaching them quickly before discharge, which would be the traditional method. So there's quite a lot of research that's been done in Europe and in the States to look at the benefits of single care family rooms. So various studies have been done, and we know that there are multiple benefits. Improved weight gain, better length, short, well, shorter lengths of stay. We know it can help with lung development. We definitely know it can improve kangaroo care. And kangaroo care can independently help to improve your neurodevelopmental outcome. Kangaroo care is just the process of skin to skin where parents, mother or father, have the baby on their chest for hopefully several hours a day and that contact really helps to improve the baby's outcome. We also know that infection rates are less in babies and we've done our own um, independent research at Barnet showing that the depression scores are much better in our parents who are in the individualised care rooms versus those in the open bays. And as I've already said, parental education is just a much smoother process in those rooms. We do try to ensure that we provide really good developmental care throughout the neonatal unit and we want parents to feel that they can have that experience wherever they are, whether they're in an open bay or in, in one of our rooms. Um, because of course some families have many children at home and it's difficult for them to room in. So we don't put, extra, we don't put pressure on them to be in these rooms but mostly we find that we have families queuing up to get into our rooms. We have, of our 30 cots, 10 of them are in these individual rooms. And this slide is really just to give you a feel for the room. It's actually really hard to capture it in a photo, in one single photo without a wide angle lens. But essentially, in each room, you have a sink, a bed, somewhere for the parents to store their things. Um, we have full access to medical resuscitation equipment, so oxygen, suction, all those sort of things that are obviously very important in terms of any risk. We have a monitoring equipment on the walls, which is linked up to central monitoring. And um, we provide kangaroo care chairs, so it's nice and comfortable for mums to breastfeed. Expressing equipment. And each room is temperature controlled, and each room is wired up for TV, and parents have access to Wi-Fi, because they need some uh, entertainment and a break as well while they're with us but obviously we encourage them to use headphones if they're watching the TV because that particular stimulation probably isn't good for our little newborn prems. 
So this is just to show you there is natural light in most of our rooms um, and our nursing ratios are the same in our individualised care rooms. So whilst the mums and dads are much more involved with their babies, they still get the same amount of nursing support. So they'll be supported to deliver more care, um, but they will um, still have the same safe numbers of nurses to look after them. And we can take um, babies in uh, just a standard cot, as you can see in this picture. But what I'll also show you as we go on that we can take babies in different stages of their neonatal stay. Our rooms are all off one single corridor where we're able to control the light. We try and keep it at a very low level most of the time. We keep sound levels very low. Um, and the, each room is wired up to central monitoring so that n the nurses can keep a very close eye on what's going on in any rooms that they're not in. Now this is just to show one of our families here where the dad's doing some kangaroo care. And again, this shows um, that we can fit in um, heated cots or we can fit in big incubators. Um, there's enough space for that. And then we also often have twins or sometimes triplets. And so you'll see in the background here quite a big cot. So sometimes we have to have three babies in one room, but that's OK. We can do that. And this is very topical. This is just in the last couple of weeks. There's been um, a big Lancet publication showing that there are many benefits from single care family rooms. And the question is being asked, are single family rooms actually the future for neonatal units in the country? So we're currently the only neonatal unit with 10 rooms like this, but I'm sure more will gradually appear. So how did we manage to do this? Well, uh, we recognise an opportunity at the point that there was a reconfiguration of services where our maternity and neonatal service on the Chase Farm site was being reconfigured so that we brought everything over to this site. And that meant we had some changes and some building going on. And um, by doing research, looking at the medical literature, we realised that uh, this model of care with individualised rooms seemed to be the way forward. And so we grasped the opportunity with both hands. And although we were limited by the footprint that was available, that was meant to be two bays, instead we converted it into these rooms. We went, to, in order to get practical advice, we had to go to Hamburg because there were no units in the con this country that we could visit. We developed a set of admission criteria. We looked at our nursing numbers um, and we, ha we had to keep them exactly the same. So it didn't help us save money in that respect, but we knew that it would provide better, a better service for our families. Um, we put in lots of education and training for our nurses because, of course, they were quite, some of them were quite wary about what would be really quite a significant change to the way that we were previously working. And we had to look at the practicalities of things like central monitoring and hotel services for the parents. This is just to show our exploratory trip that we did to Hamburg, um, which was great and actually just helped us to boost the service that we are actually already providing at that point. It opened in December 2013. Um, so we have a, a mission criteria. We try and keep things very safe. We like babies to be relatively stable, to be in those rooms. And, um, we ha but we're able to provide high dependency care. We can we can give various forms of ventilatory support, although we wouldn't have them on what you might traditionally think of as a life support machine. We're not ventilating the babies. They have to be breathing for themselves. But we can provide things like central lines um, and, and some high dependency care so that we can get babies in and mums and dads together as soon as possible after the baby's been born. But we do expect mums to have been discharged from midwifery care because it's important that the mums are no longer needing any regular input if we're expecting them to be interacting regularly with their unwell baby. And we, of course, we recognise that modern families can be um, quite diverse and mums can nominate um, two carers. So it can really depend, it varies family to family. It might involve mum and dad, it might involve grandparents, it might involve two mums, whatever. Of course, we can accommodate that in our rooms. So um, there have been some challenges along the way, as you would imagine, but I think we've been able to overcome them just by working as very closely as a team. And we have a very strong ethos on the neonatal unit that all members of the team at all levels should feel able to voice 
um, any concerns or express how they're feeling. And by doing that, we're able to solve problems really very quickly and it helps to keep things very safe in the context of if a baby becomes unwell. So we've hopefully ironed out any challenges quite quickly. Um, the, probably the most difficult thing has been actually having parents resident and getting used to providing hotel services for them. And also, th I think we often spend a lot more time with our families than we did previously, so it can be quite time consuming. But I think we all gain hugely from that in terms of our relationships with the families and the parents and our relationships with the babies. So we've had a lot of positive feedback from parents over the years. We've now had our rooms for for five years and we think we're getting better and better at doing it all the time as we get more and more experienced. That's just to show another happy family and I think overall staff are very happy with the new setup as well because they can see that it works for the families. Thank you Claire. So my name's Debbie, I'm one of our community neonatal sisters um, run from our unit. Um, I have myself and another colleague that run the community neonatal care for the area. Um, the map here is just to show you the areas we cover. Um, if we cover Barnet and Enfield and the slightly darker line comes round, so that's more or less where um, the North Circular comes round. We come quite a long area away round and we probably cover the biggest area out of most community teams at the moment. Um, we weren't the first community team, uh, we weren't the first neonatal team to be supporting parents in the community, but I believe we were the first team that was set up within the actual unit themselves and worked within the team members to be able to go out and support the parents from there. I myself started out um, been doing neonatal care for 21 years and the last 10 of those I've been doing into the community to support parents. As we've been hearing about how important the parents' input into the care of these infants are and the family-centred part of their care, it also then makes sense that the sooner that we can get these babies to be able to be well enough to go home, that the best care that they can receive will be from their families, their parents um, and their home care environment. It's much easier there for the families to be able to keep all of the environmental factors we've mentioned under control and it just normalises the whole process of the bonding and the growth <coughs> and progress that these babies need to, to make. We have a set criteria that we follow for a standard for our babies going home for community care for us to follow up. We will follow up any babies that were born under 34 weeks gestation and any babies that will go home under two kilograms in birth weight, uh, in weight, sorry, and um, babies that may have complicated, maybe congenital problems that they're going to need to go home with. We do see other babies around side that as well, because we actually work from within the unit. We can get to know these families and babies prior to discharge. So another part of our role would be to organise when that discharge is appropriate with our, working within our team and with our consultants and the nurses on the unit. So we will aim to progress those babies forward as the right timing for them, individual for each baby when they're ready. But say for these babies in our criteria, we know they're going to have probably a bit of a tougher time for the parents at home. And the community workers that parents usually get, your health visitors, and going back to the GPs may not necessarily have the experience from the premature side um, problems and care that they specifically may need. Um, so we actually aim to try and get a relationship with the parents before they go home and we come in on the ward rounds and start to get to know the babies before they're ready. So towards the tail end when we think yes, we're now getting to the stage they need to feed and grow but they're actually quite stable and well in every other way then we will start getting involved in planning the care for that baby to be able to go home. So that may include babies that um, have chronic lung disease because of their prematurity, but they're otherwise very fit and well and they're growing and ba parents are giving all their care, but they're still attached to a little bit of nasal cannula oxygen. So we may very well go home and support these babies and help to monitor them. With, we've got machines we can take out to keep an eye on their saturations, monitor their progress, come back and feed in with the consultant teams and decide what the next steps of care to get these babies progressed off of the oxygen. 
Um, and we can do things like babies may require a tube feeding at home. They may not be able to suck from a breast or a bottle and they may require a tube, um, for example, babies with cleft palates um, or babies with very poor weak sucks for congenital reasons. And they may have to have their feeds down a tube pass through their nose to their tummy. You may have seen them around with uh, tape, little babies with um, tapes to the side. And um, we will help support these, replacing the tubes, making sure the feeds that they're giving are all correct. A big part of what we do should be for supporting for these families. So when they are ready to go home, as we've heard from our lovely ICR rooms, a lot of them are much more prepared now as well anyway. We've had a lot more involvement and got to know their babies quite well. But not all our families are able to take the opportunity up. Uh, some of them may have other siblings or reasons why they can't stay so long in with their babies. So we will need to probably give them a bit more support when they get home. And uh, we do that by, as they get discharged, we're going to be taking the family's details for contact and we give the families our details. Um, we carry mobile phones during the week. We work on from a Monday to Friday basis um, and cover uh, eight till half four during the week um, between us. So that then means that families have access to maybe even just call us if they need to. And a lot of feedback I get from families often <coughs> is not necessarily they needed to see us very regularly um, as such, but they had questions, they didn't know, know what to do, baby may have been a little bit more unsettled than usual, or they may have had some change to the care they were used to, and they don't know whether it's important, do they go to their GP, do they turn up at A&E? So we can be there to guide them through that and they can make a telephone call to us or when we're doing their normal talk with them and we can discuss that and arrange whether they actually need to be seen maybe by one of our team or whether it's something we can have a, um, a talk with the parents and come to some plan together how we need to deal with that particular issue. We also help, we've started um, to help with support by um, running a nurture group for the parents to be able to come back to if after they've been discharged. So a bit like we've mentioned, we did a coffee and coping uh, group during the time that they're inpatients and we're trying to provide the kind of help equally once they're home. Parents will often find that if they're trying to get into integrated with the rest of their communities, that the local groups that they have for babies, the NCT classes and things, they've missed a lot of the beginning bit with that because they've been in hospital with us. And then when they get to go back to these mums, their babies are doing different things to their own um, experience. And although parents, we all say we shouldn't be comparing our babies, it's a natural instinct to do that. And my one's sleeping through the night, my one's feeding this much, is yours smiled yet? And these parents often feel a little bit out of the loop with that because there may be some delays that are normal for their babies, but that they feel compared to other terms makes them something wrong. So this group is to hopefully they can then be able to come and talk with ourselves or maybe with amongst the mums themselves to start performing their own support groups and their own, uh, they often will then click in and get their own phone calls going together and meetings and discussing between themselves what's, what's one's done to what the other one's done, how did they manage that, you know, how did you get yours to sleep all night and what did, so that then starts the support process to be able to move them on out of, out of that with their um, so we try and run that once a week and we're there to give advice as well. So if they do have problems with their feeding or they're growing and they've got specific questions, maybe the health as the clinics where they would normally go won't necessarily know those answers, whereas our experience enables us to do that. So we also then uh, link in back in with Emily, our OT. Um, and we do another, she does another little session group that we link in and we come and visit in on at the same time and link together. And she runs a little group called Little Stars. So if I can, do you want to come and tell them a little bit about the Little Stars group? <laughs> so there are two initiatives. You're not, you're not passionate about <laughs> Okay, really quickly, just two things that we do in addition to that. We have Supper Club, which is once a month, and it is our previous matron cooks up a storm. We do a talk on development, and it's a chance. 
Yeah, lovely Joe. It's a chance for everybody to support each other and just meet. And so that's once a month. And then the other one is Little Stars, which was initially set up for 32 weeks and up. And then everyone underneath said, that's not fair. It's got to be for everybody. And it's massage. We check infant development and it's to give you your, your people, really. If you missed out on your NCT class, it's to give you your peer group, your WhatsApp group. <laughs> that is it. So should we? So that's just examples of what Little Stars looks like. <laughs> OK, that was it. <laughs> thank you to our panel. Thank you to our attendees, our parents, our babies. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Starlight. You are demonstrating that you've got a very impressive team and that you're all engaged with delivering the best outcome for the babies, patients, your colleagues. You've got a wonderful team and we're so proud of you here at Barnet. Um, I've, as I've said, I've worked here for so many years and we're on level three and we weren't aware that you're doing such impressive work and thank you for sharing and we will also take it back and share i've got two of my staff member here that i've invited we will share with our team wonderful thank you very much indeed we're very proud of you here at barnet <laughs>